Hi everyone, uh, welcome to uh, our webinar, uh, How is the Golden Thread of Information Created and Applied? Uh, I'm delighted to say we've got three great speakers with us today. Um, Alex Blaylock, um, Oliver Jones and, and Graham Kelly. And we're going to be looking at, as the title suggests, how the Golden Thread of Information is, is created and applied. Now, the Golden Thread as a concept, um, it's been in um, circulation quite uh, frequently over recent months, um, mainly due to the prominence of the, the Hackett report um, into the Grenfell disaster and the opportunities to create a, a continuous thread of information through the life cycle of a project to uh, predominantly improve the uh, uh, building, safety, uh, building safety performance. Um, the idea of a golden thread has actually been around for a few years. Um, government soft landings a few years ago uh, raised the importance of potentially creating a continuous framework for structured information throughout the life cycle of a project. And the National Planning Policy Framework uh, has also referenced this idea of a golden thread. So when you think about it, it's actually a very logical um, uh, thing to, to aspire to. And I think the Hackett report and Renfall was a real wake up call to the industry to get its act together to actually um, work towards having a, uh, a structured approach to how we create, manage and use information through the whole life, life cycle uh, of a building. So it's very, very timely. And I think uh, I'm going to hand over to Alex to start um, with her talk, which is really focusing around uh, Grenfell and, and the, the uh, outcome of the, uh, the Hackett report. So I'll hand over to, to Alex. Great, thank you, Peter. So I'm kind of beginning, I'm setting the scene really for the discussions further down the line about the golden thread. Um, and I guess I'm kind of looking at what's happened over the past few years that has sort of set this landscape that we're currently in. Um, so if we just flick to the first slide. So this isn't something new and this isn't something that's happened post Grenfell. Um, over the past 60 years, there's been some key milestones in construction um, and a series of tragedies, which has kind of started to sort of form the form the, um, the construction industry that we work in. Uh, the first one of those would be um, probably most people would be familiar with this um, Ronan Point, which was a, a uh, structural collapse of the corner of a building after a gas explosion. So it was down to a mix of poor design and poor construction. Um, and, and this kind of led to um, a loss of public confidence in high rise buildings. Um, and that was kind of the starting point for the catalyst of changes to the UK building regs, um, which is now embodied in part A. Um, if we flick onto the next slide. Pre Grenfell in 2009, Lacknell House um, was a fire which killed six people. This again had the same story where there'd been a refurbishment, poor quality, um, there was a lack of safety inspections, but this wasn't quite enough to drive the change. Uh, as we move on to the next slide, we get to Grenfell which is obviously the tragedy that's in everybody's mind and the reason behind the Hackett report and probably the reason why we're sat here today. Um, 72 people died and were unable to get out of the building safely, which for me was absolutely terrifying. And that's how I've kind of ended up having an interest in all of this and what's been happening in the industry. Um, so there's a number of discussions as to what happened at Grenfell, which is obviously coming out in the inquiry that's going ahead. Um, and how things could have been improved during the response. But ultimately, that problem lies with the construction industry and the Hackett report is a pretty damning commentary. Um, and that's kind of part of the reason why we're all kind of here today listening to this. So if we just flick on to the next slide, the um, key system failings that the Hackett report um, brought about has got some pretty um, horrendous words related to it in the construction industry. Um, we've got unclear roles and responsibilities, um, inadequate resident engagement. So there was no way for residents to escalate their concerns. And quite often these were ignored when they did. Um, there was weak compliance, enforcement and sanctions. So the current system for assessing buildings and ensuring that they meet the standards was seen as being totally inadequate. 
Um, and then there was weak sanctions, which means that there was no real um, drive for people to comply. Um, there was a lack of competence within the industry. Uh, the means of assessing and ensuring that people were competent working on high rise and complex buildings was seen as inadequate. Um, product quality was questioned. Um, the existing system relating to the testing, marketing, quality insurance was seen to be insufficient. And then there was generally ignorance. Um, regulations and guidance weren't being understood by the people that need to understood it. And in some cases, they weren't even being read. Um, words like indifference, so primary motivation of contractors was to do things quickly and as cheaply as possible, rather than delivering quality and safety for people that were going to be living in the homes, um, where there were concerns raised uh, by residents or by people working on the projects, these were often ignored, um, lack of clarity. Um, on roles and responsibilities. So there's an ambiguity into who is accountable for the building itself. Um, there seemed to be an inadequate regulatory oversight and enforcement tools. So there was no there was no kind of like nothing that was promoting people um, following the rules um, and the penalties put in place weren't strong enough. Um, so yeah, and when enforcement was necessary, it was often not pursued um, and said the penalties were so, so small, it was an ineffective deterrent. So just moving on to the next slide, post Grenfell, um, there's been a series of fires since then, which have been in the news. Um, so it's not a problem that's gone away after Grenfell happened. It's something that's still happening. And although there wasn't necessarily a loss of life on the fires that are listed here, they've all been quite high profile. And all of the issues have been associated to cladding or poor renovations or choice of layouts and materials. So it's something that we're still dealing with. And it's obviously been brought by one major tragedy, Grenfell, but it's something that's still in everyone's minds and is constantly revisited by the press. So just moving on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so just to kind of run through what's happened since Grenfell, there's been a series of documents released and the first of those began with um, Dame Judith Hackett's interim and final reports. So the interim report was released six months after the tragedy. The final report was released 12 months after the tragedy. This outlined all of those failings that I've just been through. Um, it also set out a series of recommendations um, for how changes or um, how the construction industry could change to address all these issues. At the same time as that final report being released, the government released its implementation plan, which was essentially a document which adopted all of those recommendations. And although there were no proposals as such as to how to, how to deliver them, it was essentially the government signing up to those recommendations and taking them on board. So since then, in April of this, oh, Sorry. Since then, in April of this year, um, they released the consultation document, which was more of the strategies and more of the actual um, the processes that were going to be put in place on how they were going to manage these um, changes and how they were going to adopt these recommendations. Since then, um, at the beginning of July, they released the Building Safety Bill, um, which essentially was the law that was going to be put into place um, to adopt all the procedures that were set out in the consultation document. Um, however, the latest on that, that is last week, I think it was voted down by the Tories. So I'm not quite sure where that sits um, and how that will progress, but ultimately something is going to change in the coming future. So if you just move on to the next slide. So just as all, the, all these documents that have been produced over the last two, three years, um, they've been fed into by a series of working groups that were set up by Dame Judith Hackett, groups one to seven, seven probably being the newest one, which was the golden thread. Um, all of these are being fed into by all the companies and kind of industry bodies on the right hand side. So there's been um, a lot of consultation with all these bodies that are fed into um, what and ended up being the recommendations that came out of the Hackett report. If we just move on again. 
So the go in the government's response in the consultation document, um, it was cited as for being for buildings for 18 metres or six storeys. However, just for the purpose of today's discussion, I'm going to ignore that. Um, the, one of the driving factors that came out of the Hackett report was this need for a culture change um, throughout the industry. So I think regardless of whether the building is over 18 metres or not, if it's a culture change that is needed, then the height of the building is irrelevant. It needs to be something that we're considering through all our projects. The government proposed essentially a series of changes to each of the stages of a building's life. Um, that would be during design, construction, during occupation, and then just a consideration of the lifespan of the building. Within that consultation document, all the bullet points here are the items that it covered and kind of the strategies that were suggested for each of those elements. I'm very quickly today going to run through this concept of the gateways that are being introduced. Um, a look into the duty holders, which includes the accountable person, building safety manager. Um, just explaining what a safety case is, which is something that's referenced within the document and is one of the key parts of the golden thread. And then across the lifespan of the building, we've got the sort of golden thread itself. And I've got a diagram which is going to link all of these things together and kind of explain it. So if we just move on to the next slide. So. As a starting point, the gateways that are being introduced are um, pre-planning considerations. So there's essentially going to be um, three hard stop points where you're going to have to provide information to the new building safety regulator who would be um, operating underneath the HSE. So what will happen at gateway one as the designers are developing their information um, when you submit for planning, there would be a need to provide some documentation um, with regards to emergency fire access and a sort of uh, fire strategy. And that's something that's going to be consulted with at the planning stage with the local fire authority. So as um, many people will be aware of the general planning process and all the different consultees that are involved, the fire authority would be brought forward a stage. Um, so brought in front of building control and they would essentially be consulted at that planning stage. Uh, at gateway two, um, after a full set of information has been introduced, there's going to be a hard stop before any construction can start on site. And that information will need to be signed off and approved by the regulator. So very similar to the Scottish warrant system. Um, there is an understanding that many projects work under the design and build method. So it would be potentially staged between sort of like different points, substructure, superstructure, but each of those elements would need to be signed off before construction could start. And then we would be looking at gateway three, which would be the handover and sign off. So all of that sets of information that's being collated through the design process, um, including as built plans, um, would need to be collated and this would all this information would sit within that safety case which would then be approved by the building safety regulator before occupation could happen. One of the key points that came out of this was that there would be a need for the client, the principal designer and the principal contractor to co-sign a final declaration. We've had quite a lot of discussions within the company about this need for as built plans um, as often last construction issue is where we um, where we provide information. But the need for as built plans kind of adds a new level of oversight that might be required for us to be able to verify that what is actually being built on site is um, what was on the final set of drawings. So there's a bit of a that's that's kind of, I guess, a bit of a point that needs to be considered as processes for companies go forward. Um, and we've had discussions internally about whether there is kind of a need for the clerk of work role to come back so that somebody is monitoring what's happening on site. Um, and move on to the next slide, please. So just to move on to this idea of like the duty holders and how they've been defined. Um, there's some images here that will be helpful to remember for the next slide, which sets out the diagram. But we have this idea of the accountable person um, that could be your client. So the client that has um, like 
procured the building um, and once the building if they're the person that is essentially going to own it afterwards they'd be classed as that accountable person this is something that's written on the building certificate so it's a documented piece of information um, from there, that accountable person who is responsible for the building has a responsibility to appoint a building safety manager. The building safety manager then is the person that would liaise with residents and would keep control of that safety case to make sure that it's up to date. Other key people that need to be remembered are the principal designers and the designers and the principal contractor. Um, and all of these duty holders have got a responsibility at that process of meeting each of those gateways. So if we just move on to the next slide. So this is a very simplified diagram of constructing a building and how all of this feeds back in. So if I start at the top left hand corner, we have our client accountable person who has an idea, who passes this on to the, usually the principal designer that he'll need to appoint, including the rest of the design team. A series of information will be produced and at that point they're going to hit gateway one and they're going to need to submit some information to pass that first gateway. So that would be a planning, you would gain planning approval. From then, a series of information would be produced and passed on to the contractor. At that point, the contractor is going to hit gateway two and that information is going to need to be signed off before the building can start construction. During construction, um, they will build, they may have a series of like gateway two kind of sign offs, um, but before anyone can occupy the building, before that can be passed back to the accountable person, they're going to have to do this sign off for gateway three. So that's the sort of third stop point before anyone can occupy it to say that everything has been built to building regulations and it's compliant. At the point that the accountable person becomes responsible for the building, um, the blue arrow moving to the green at the right hand side, he's got the responsibility to um, put in place a building safety manager. The building safety manager is going to engage with the accountable person because he is um, he needs to undertake the day to day duties and making sure the building is safe. He's also going to be engaging with the residents that live in the houses in the case of the, um, the, the scope of the buildings for this. But that would be potentially any of the building users if it was extended beyond residential. He is responsible for this safety case. The safety case is a collection of information that is sort of collected from the first point of the client through each of the designers through the contractor and we've got um, essentially these kind of say from the designers the red line we've got as built drawings we've got strategies we've got this idea of the specification all of this information is collated and fed into the safety case as is things like client supply items that might be outside of the contract you'd want to consider information and product information and um, health and safety manuals and operation manuals that are going to come from the contractor. All of this information feeds back into that safety case. The diagram in grey at the bottom is something that I took from blockchain presentation that I was looking at, but I think it really nicely shows that like that build up of information from when something say leaves a factory or is dug out of the earth and it gets processed and at each stage along its journey at any point where something might happen or an additional piece of documentation documentation is collected this all builds up so this this kind of diagram kind of explains i guess a need of traceability back through the industry which doesn't really exist at the moment um and the discussions for the golden thread and how this is built up essentially um suggest that we should have as much traceability as the food in industry would if you received a can of beans without any beans in it. Um, you'd be able to go back to the factory, you would know exactly the point where that item had failed. So for quality of product, um, that degree of traceability and understanding where some things come from um, should be something that forms part of that golden thread that feeds into the safety case. 
So the safety case itself is reviewed by the building safety regulator. And once it's like approved, this could be a constant cycle, depending on how often changes are made to the building or if there's anything that the building safety manager needs to edit as part of that safety case. There's also the consideration, which is a key part of the golden thread, is that if the accountable person chooses to make any changes to the building, this might be fed back through a designer or it could go straight back to the contractor. All of that information should come back to that safety case and should sit as that kind of continued development of changes that have happened to the building. So that is the diagram that kind of explains kind of the golden thread and how all of these elements and the government's proposals fit together. So if we just move on to the final slide. So I think obviously we've started at Grenfell and previous fires, but it's not just about fire. Um, there's kind of a wider discussion of what this golden thread means um, and how this links into strategies digitally, environmentally, socially, because ultimately this is all about well-being um, and it also kind of links into this kind of economic climate human well-being link that brings all of this together and what the essentially the goals are for so i think that leads probably quite nicely on to ollie um, who will pick up the next part of the presentation hi guys thanks for joining us um uh, leading on from what alex has been talking about i think the golden thread to this point has really been born out of the need to reform and reform the sector and the industry. Uh, I think it's important to take a step back and look at the wider context that this exists in and also some of the things that are coming down the pipeline that will have an impact on what the golden thread might look like as we move forward. And a lot of that work is around performance measurement and performance verification. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about that now. Next slide, Grim. So that in terms of definitions, let's just begin by looking at how people are currently defining the golden thread. It's going through a little bit of an infancy in terms of definitions. There's a lot flying around at the moment. We've got the work that Alex has described and, and talked us through around the Hackett review. And this really focuses on a definition around design intent and fire risk assessment. Again, highlighted in red here, so that the original design intent is preserved and recorded with access to up-to-date information and so that we can effectively carry out fire risk assessment and decide and determine whether action is required. Next. We've also then got more definitions that are around fire again, but structural safety and information management. Here we're talking about fire and structural safety information that has to be held digitally to enforce specific standards. A process of robust information management that's always kept up to date and a way that information can be managed so that building safety is prioritised throughout the life cycle of the building. And that's from the UK Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government. Next. Then finally, at the moment, we've got definitions that really revolve around function, planning and then decision taking. And all of these can be traced back to the Hackett report. But they all exist independently in their own reviews. So. We've got the UK government soft landings framework. It says the reason for the creation of an asset and its intended purpose should be that golden thread. And then we've got the UK's national planning policy framework that talks about a thread that runs through both plan making and then decision taking on projects. Moving on. It's important to see this in the wider context of the UK construction sector deal. Um, you know, over 10% of the UK workforce is employed in construction, as well as the allied supply and maintenance industries. And the impact of improving this sector is is incredible. And if we can if we can achieve those productivity and efficiency gains. So the government put 170 million pounds of funding in to make this happen. This was also matched by 250 million pounds of industry funding. The programme was over four years and the idea was to develop a sustainable long term model within the industry. Um, next slide. The targets of this were to look at. Lowering costs by 33 percent, improving delivery in terms of speed by 50 percent, reducing our emissions or carbon emissions by 50 percent, and then also improving our exports by up to 50 percent. So 
this is the landscape in which all of these reforms are being considered. And the key to this is the faster delivery, the greater productivity to lower costs, and at the same time, reducing those lower emissions. Next slide. So it really calls, the government calls for root and branch reform with a focus on three strategic outcomes. The first is to do things digitally, and this is to deliver, deliver better, more certain outcomes that we can use digital technologies for. The second is around manufacturing, and that's about improving productivity, quality and safety. Um, and then the third is around performance and optimizing through life performance. And I think from what Alex has talked us through so far, you can see that the golden thread exists in all three of those strategic outcomes. Next slide. We're at this nexus that Alex has referred to around economic activity, around climate change and around well-being. You know, and I've got it down here is this 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 nexus between social health, digital growth and environmental health and a real focus and a lot of new initiatives that are coming to, to the foreground. And at the center of these is the need to have information on performance. And for me, this is where the golden thread starts to develop. It's not just about fire safety. It's a fantastic place to start and it absolutely needs to happen. But it's also about how do we capture performance? How do we measure performance and verify performance in relation to all of the other agendas that are going on at the moment? So how do we capture value using a uh, golden thread using information. How do we understand our progress with regards to social health and our progress with regards to environmental health? Next slide. So part of the work that came out of the Hackett Review uh, was also very, very closely followed by a procuring for value report by the Construction Leadership Council and Anne Bentley. Um, and a key statement here is that people are looking for quick fixes constantly and what we need to understand is that root and branch reform is, is required absolutely and this has to be a turning point within our industry to bring about cultural change. This has been recognised and reiterated in a number of government reports but it boils down to the fact that we have very little vision in terms of what, what we want for our industry and our sector in the future and we have a bit of a value problem. Next slide. So the Procuring for Value report by the CLC and Anne Bentley highlighted that there was a systematic lack of joined up action within the industry and also recognised that the potential prize is absolutely huge. It could lead to £15 billion worth of savings annually if our, if our sector was to get itself in order with regards to how we manage information. Next slide. If we add to that in this document, that it's about whole life efficiency, it's about economies of scale, it's absolutely about health and safety as Alex has covered, um, and there's a focus on delivery through standardization and new manufacturing processes. This is this is the buzzwords and all the conversations going on around modern methods of construction that everybody's talking about at the moment. And then we've got op all of those opportunities are underpinned by digital technologies. They can't be delivered without engaging with digital technologies. So the industry genuinely is on the cusp of structural change and Anne Bentley recognises this in the UK Construction Leadership Council publication Procuring for Value. Next slide. That Procuring for Value work has now developed significantly and also been fast tracked during COVID um, by the government. It was initially on a 24 month timeline, it then moved to 18. It's now been fast tracked to a six month delivery timeline to deliver this, which is the value toolkit. And the Construction Innovation Hub are, are heading up this work in partnership with others and the Construction Leadership Council. And they've called for the fact that we need a different approach. Again, reiterating what I've said already around the work for procuring for value and around Dame Judith Hackett's recommendations uh, with regards to the Grenfell review. We need one, one uh, an approach that targets value and also whole life performance. And this is a, an ambition that was set out in the construction sector deal and then following key policy documents such as the IPA's transforming infrastructure performance. So everything within this government realm now is starting to turn its focus on not only our sector, but how is our sector enabling us to seek and deliver better value on the projects? We need to set stronger objectives and we also need to deliver them and will be measured on that. And this is the point of the value toolkit. Next slide. So the way this value toolkit is developing 
and bear in mind the intention of the value toolkit is to reform the way our sector does business the value toolkit will only initially apply to public sector projects but there is an underlying intention that this will then move on to reform projects in the private sector as well it's a suite of tools to support value-based decision making and at the minute it's split into four different modules and rider are really heavily involved in informing um, this process of developing the value toolkit and the definitions and the metrics that are involved in it. So we've got module one. This is all about setting objectives, creating a value profile and making a mark and saying this is what we will achieve on a project. It then moves through into delivery and procure procurement. And the bit where I think um, really shows us where the golden thread might be useful moving forward is, of course, we can see that it will be useful in setting objectives and monitoring them. Of course, we can see from what Alex has shown us that it has a plot to play in the delivery and the procurement of a project, but it's the ongoing measurement and verification of a project where I think this really starts to, to pull through and, and shows that we need a lot more data to be aligned with our idea of the golden thread in order to meet these new requirements that are being set out by the government. Next slide. So, what does it look like? What is this value toolkit that I'm talking about? Well, we've got, it's all built around five capitals model. We've got natural capital, social capital, human capital, manufactured and financial. And arguably today, you could say that within the human capital, physical and mental well-being as one small area captures that building safety element. But as you can see from this diagram, that is one metric within about 25 other metrics that are being put forth to identify whether a project is successfully delivering the value that it set out to achieve at the beginning of the process. So each project in this value toolkit will have to define what it will achieve in each of these areas and they will be held to very specific um, guidelines and baseline baselines that are set by other standards that are out there at the minute. So next slide. So these standards already exist. We've got standards in development for embodied carbon, for operational carbon, uh, for carbon and greenhouse gas emissions. We've got standards that are also uh, in there for social value that are already under development, and these will be included in this. Now, what I'm getting at here is that with regards to the golden thread, there is a much bigger information management game at play here. We have to start to be uh, not only recording and capturing information in all of these fields so that we can evidence our own progress and evaluate whether or not we are meeting the objectives that we set ourselves. Um, and that's going to become really critical in terms of how we do business moving forward as a sector. Next slide. So this is why it's critical, because when you put in your tender document, the whole point around the value toolkit is that you'll be asked to set your own objectives and create your own value profile for the project that you're tendering for. And you'll also then be compared to everybody else that is tendering for that project and it will result in a pass and fail. Now, that's just the first, first stage. You, those objectives and that measurement and verification will be revisited throughout the process of design and construction and then well into the operational phase of a project. So you have to meet the objectives even well into the operational phase of a project that you set out at the beginning. Now, as, as, as an industry and as businesses within our industry, we have to be able to say, right, confidently, we can measure these things that we say we're going to achieve, and we can verify whether or not we are performing the way that we say we're going to perform. And this is, this is the ultimate gesture in terms of uh, reforming the industry and also traceability and accountability and responsibility that Dame Judith Hackett talks about all the way back then in the buildings, uh, building safety report and uh, has been picked up in the procurement for value work by the Construction Leadership Council. And the only way we can capture this information is digitally. So all of this starts to feed into this conversation around the golden thread and what that might look like. Next slide. I just want to, you know, there's a lot of work going on at the moment. This is one of our research funding applications that went in earlier this year, and it's around our view of what that new golden thread might look like. And it is incredibly complex, but it's our job within the industry to try to simplify it, to identify the objectives that we're setting ourselves, identify the information that's coming out of those objectives, and then 
track that throughout the life cycle of a project. Now, the work I've shown you today on the value toolkit, I honestly believe is going to have a, a, a real lasting implication, not only on the sector, but on our notions of a golden thread of information on a project. Thanks a lot. I'll hand over to Graham Kelly now. Thanks, Ollie. Um, thanks, guys, for, for attending. The sorry, just muting over. The um, if you could just drop your questions in the Q and A slot, um, that would be fantastic, and we'll we'll get a we'll get a Q and A part at the end of end of this. Um, both fascinating talks um, prior to prior to this one. Really trying to build that case of of where it where it started, but also um, where we can get to with it. And I think what all I wanted to do was really drop in a couple of practical examples of of where we as BIM Academy have of um have implemented a, a golden thread of, of of sorts. I suppose it's not it's not exactly what's been described in 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 what Alex is doing or what Oliver's doing. But um it again it, it's all about how we how we collect and manage information during um during uh, design build handover operation of of um of buildings. So the first one um, to talk about is the the Country Garden Forest City, where we were working for uh, those guys for a, for a couple of years now, um, looking at how we can implement um, a digital way of of um, going from from the very start of design all the way and briefing all the way through into into operation. Their long term goal of that site is to um, manage um, the the city, if you like, as as a smart city. Um, they're building twenty billion pounds worth of or dollars worth of um of new reclaimed land and, and residential and, and office space um just off the coast of malaysia um but they wanted to start at a micro level so a building level and um, understand what data they could collate on the building understand how they monitor and maintain that that data and then and then move through into into how they manage it maybe it's a smart city um so our role was to support them on that um pilot project um the idea with the project was we, we would um, review the briefing information, try and standardize the data and information they were going to collate, develop that information during the build phase and uh, design and build phase, uh, make sure that we're auditing it, auditing it for compliance all the way through, uh, implement that, that data through and then at handover sort of elevate that into um, how do we manage and maintain that data through um, the life cycle of, of that building. Um, in terms of setting the standard, it was very much about understanding what was best practice um, in the region, but also internationally, putting that into a protocol document that enabled um, them to to under the country garden to understand what was required for each um, of their of their buildings or their spaces. Uh, and then we looked at a couple of buildings um, the, the stadium and uh, their landmark building uh, into specifying exactly what was required from a data perspective. Uh, an information perspective for those with the idea that you would do that for every every building that came on um, came online. Um, we had to um, set a standard around um, the um, both the space and, and the assets. So what information are we collecting on on the building itself and the spaces that sit within in, within that? How does that fit within a within a hierarchy of, of um, a spatial hierarchy of, of data requirements? Uh, and then also, how do you link that into um, the physical assets that you're going to maintain on site? Um, and so um, this is very much for anyone who recognizes it, this is very much the, the COVID schema, the SM92 part four schema, um, which is the, the British standard for how you uh, manage um, the collation of, of that data. Um, the slight intricacies were that we had to also set sort of um, not only levels, um, which is which is what here. So you, you've got a high rise building that with the landmark building is. Um, you've also got to set what information you require on that building. Um, and again, this was done um, utilizing best practice um, BSL 92 part four and, and the like um, to collate it. Um, the other thing that we did, um, which is quite interesting, was was looking at the complexity of the objects needed um, for managing and maintaining and the building. So if you think about um, where the government's pushing us to manage and maintain all changes that we make to a building, well, if you've got very complex digital objects within your 
within your design and within your construction. Once that goes into operation, having to maintain them becomes an increasingly um, uh, resource intensive task. The idea here was that could we um, reduce the complexity of the objects within um, the design and build, but also um, with the still same spatial um, size, if you like, but also um, make sure that we, we were sort of reducing down the complexity of the objects within that building to make sure that it was easier to manage and maintain as we move forward. Um, so this is uh, an example of, of the landmark building. Um, this was at the very start of the project. Uh, there's about, I can't remember how many, 18, 19, 20 stories on top of there that would, would go on top. Um, fairly um, sizable asset for a pilot project. Um, lots of mixed use um, elements on the on the um, sort of um, lower floors and then it goes into a hotel and residential units, residential units above um, off the off the Straits of uh, Johar in, in Malaysia. So that's a, it as it sort of increases in size, if you like. Um, and that's near completion of the landmark building. And what and what we were trying to do within this, as I said before, is, is set those standards at the start, brief it, and then how to and then set how we collate that information during the during the design and then construction phase of of the space, so that we can hand it over, so that the guys on site can manage and maintain that information throughout. So what we did um, during construction was we implemented a software called Ecodomus which um, can um, provide the rigorous approach to collation of uh, your operational maintenance manuals, your health and safety files, your asset information, um, and it can also link that to the to the model itself, so the spatial information, which is what is on the screen at the moment. Um, and then what you can also do with that is you can then hand that over into operation and um, Ecodomus uses is an integration platform um, that can be used for um, managing and maintaining that space throughout. It, it, com it has a, a link, direct link to the models. Um, so that if anything's changed in the models, it, it reflects within the within the integration platform and then you can update the information either in the model or, or at the back end. So um, I suppose a, an example of where we've taken um, a project all the way through from briefing um, into, into operation and the, the guys over there are, are now using that um, to operate and maintain the, the golden thread of information within that within that space. Um, the second project I wanted to, to briefly touch upon was was a research project that um, BIM Academy did um, with Northumbria and, and National Energy Foundation and your Homestead Castle um, a couple of years ago now, which was really about how do we start to understand the performance um, and the well-being of of um, the um, of buildings that that social um, uh, tenants are, are using. Um, I guess the aim of the project was really to try and combine the 3D geometry with the um, with the data produced from the BIM um, process to to create this um, overall model of the of the of the space, um, feeding in feedback, um, building in the the building physics models, feeding in smart metering and sensoring to to create actionable advice and feedback. Um, for um, both landlords and tenants to understand more about how to how to maximize or optimize the performance of the of the building they either live in or, ma or manage. Um, I guess why uh, this touch upon a lot of the stuff that we've already talked about, whether it's procuring for value, or whether it's the stuff that Alex was talking about in the safety case. Um, we have a woeful understanding of how performance build um, perform and use, um, especially residential buildings that we live in. Um, we've talked about the Hackett report. Um, Four million children live in fuel poverty within the UK, a number of those in social homes. Um, damp homes cost the NHS 3.6 million pound a day um, in um, uh, diseases born from, from damp and cold homes. Um, yeah, 13 percent of social rent is a fuel core and maintenance costs quadruple in cold homes. So it's a shocking indictment of our industry to know that we, we've got a woeful understanding of how these buildings perform, um, but we know it costs four times more to manage cold homes than it does to manage well-performing homes, good performing homes. So um, there's a real opportunity within our industry to push for um, better understanding of that. And that comes from having a, a well-maintained um, golden thread of, of um, information within within the building. Um, I suppose as, as Ollie touched upon before, um, the, the values in the data, right? The, the, the data is the new oil. 
Um, it's really about how do we how do we collect data and then use it for 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 value for um, for better quality of life for householders for for lower for lower maintenance costs and then better understandings of the buildings through the wider feeding this back into the wider um, supply chain. All stuff that the Hackett report is is talking about. So for the research project itself, we did a pilot project um, looking at um, a um, block of flats in um, in Kenton in, in the northeast of England. Um, brand new brand new flats we effectively um, were using on this. We had a 3D model. We had the, the elements um, all in place. We just had to uh, attach the sensors. I think for for just to touch on YHN and a little story really about what what problems they're going through and, and what they need to understand is that they, they understand they've got a, a ton of complaints around remedial work and mold and cold homes. Um, tenants aren't always issue um, reporting them um, promptly. So um, as soon as mold gets gets found, it's not being reported. So that becomes exacerbates the problem. Then that's when it costs more to complete. Um, again, YHN have have little understanding of, of the building performance plan versus actual. Um, so it's it's really about and the data spread across multiple systems. So trying to pull that all together for a better understanding would would hugely support um, YHN in being more productive in, in the operation of their space. Um, so the solution we put together was really about how we visualize the trends um, through a 3D model, how we pull the data together in, in graphical and visual information and how we produce that, that alert library, if you like, around um, what sits there. Uh, we installed a number of sensors on site, so Buildax, Temcon, Open Energy Monitor. We monitored temperature, light, humidity, movement, um, windows, doors open, closed, CO2 information, um, uh, and we tested a number of um, different sensors, I suppose, and we fed them into a Raspberry Pi, and then that was fed up to a database and linked via API. Um, and the end of the, I suppose, the end of the Research project, um, we had a, a fairly basic 3D viewer that could split the model up um, and could uh, start to highlight where um, there were issues within the building. So highlight um, different sections and different apartments, all of the information fed into via uh, the spatial hierarchy that we talked about within Forest City fed into that. Um, we've got all of the data inputs for the for the projects, uh, for the sensor, sorry, within the within the building being able to link them to the space that they're associated to. Um, so that was a task that we did and then um, having the graphical information behind it that was then we starting to analyze around um, what what sits within there. Um, and that included sort of historical graphs of, of humidity and, and, and what have you. Um, really, really interesting. You can start, start to see when people come home, you can start to see when people start cooking within the just all to extrapolate it through the data and um, although we can anonymize all of that so we're, we're protecting people's um, anonymity um, really really interesting insights in terms of how homes are used and how they perform how quickly temperature drops off after heating goes off really important elements of this uh, and then we we added an alert uh, library to this which um, allowed us to uh, start to feed in the alerts and then we were going to move on to advice um, I suppose next steps of this, we've we've um, took it on board within within Rider and BIM Academy to start to look at how we improve the viewing element of this. So um, the um, front end, we're now looking, we're using a Forge engine, um, working with a um, with both with Rider and a, and a design company in, in Germany. Um, explore better hardware, use hardware that's out there on the market already. So uh, companies like um, Switchy that we've been talking to recently about how we might combine what we're doing with, with what they're doing, um, looking at, at um, linking it to soft landings, post documents evaluation, um, creating that advice library, working with organizations to sort of improve the link between the models and the data. And I think what I want to leave you with, the thought I want to leave you with is that if we're doing it anyway, so if the golden thread, the Hackett report, the government's going to start mandating this maintenance of a golden thread, digital information on a building, if we're doing it anyway, why don't we make more use of it? Why don't we optimize the value of what we're trying to do? So why don't we why don't we start looking at performance of the building as well as having this digital model that we've got to keep up to date that we've got to spend money on? So for me, that's a really important thing is if if we're already going to start collecting this data on high rise buildings, let's start looking at how we have to optimize that value. Um, 
if there are any questions, just drop them in the q and I think we've got a couple uh, coming through uh, and um, we'll go from there. Peter, I'll hand it back over to, to yourself. OK, thanks everyone. Thanks for some very thought provoking uh, presentations. Um, we've got a couple of questions uh, come in. Uh, first one's from Erland. Um, it says uh, the significant data collection and storage required to consolidate and deliver at each of the, the gateways uh, that would be mentioned as part of the, the presentations, particularly Alex's. And this isn't just around safety. Who's ideally suited to host, collate, verify, validate, and submit this data? Any thoughts from you guys on that? I'll um, I'll I'll take the first punt, and then we can um, we can hand that over if if other guys have got a thought. I think um, what's important is we've got to we've got to support clients in 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 making sure that they um, are getting better at, at, at utilizing this information. We're doing some work with Scottish Futures Trust at the moment. They've done some fantastic work with uh, their standardized information management plan that they're rolling out at the moment. That's all about building up um, the, the knowledge of the clients and, and making sure the clients have standardized information and making sure that the clients um, are, have a um, at least an accessible point of um, part of um, a common data environment. So during design and construction, um, there has to be a, um, a, the, the use of these common data environments to make sure that we're collating this data. Um, once we hand over into operation, um, it, it really it falls um, on the client to start to, to manage their data better. There's, there's of course, um, organisations, third parties that, that can support that. Um, but I think one of the things that we found over the, over the years when we're supporting clients is that um, there's a lot of loss of control of data. And actually, you can get a lot more value from um, from starting to, to control that information, if you like, as a client. So and um, we like to work with clients to, to sort of support them in, in managing and collecting that information. And it's got to be supported by um, by technology software. Um, and, and they're more and more uh, coming out all the time. I don't know if other guys have got any thoughts. Yeah, I'll add a bit to that again. I think I think from my perspective, and it touches on your last points as well, um, in answer to Erlen's question around who is ideally suited to host this, I think at the minute it's it's very difficult to point at anyone that's ideally suited to host it as a client. Uh, I think the, the emphasis falls on on working with companies and consultants that can enable this kind of insight into into pulling this information together and helping people manage this information. Um, just to touch on Graham's last points around where we go next as an industry. The, the responsibility is on us to to get our act in order and to, to to increase our learning and knowledge around being able to pull together this golden thread of information on our design projects and our construction projects. Because if we don't do that, then there are other companies poised and waiting in the wings to to come in, um, to, uh, traditional technology companies to come in and do that for us. Now we lose a huge um, edge if that happens. We've got an unprecedented opportunity here to gain an insight um, into um, building performance and in order to optimize not only our working processes and efficiencies, but to optimize the buildings and the performance of the buildings that we create. And if we don't coalesce as an industry and work with the people who have the most knowledge in this space at the moment to do that, then there are these other companies waiting in the wings to just come and do that for us. And we will not get those beneficial insights uh, in, into the process. So that, that's just my thoughts on that. Yeah, I would okay. agree with what Ollie said on that. It, the government are going to set out a series of like, I guess, um, ideals on the information that is going to be needed as part of what is collated and how is that how that is done and managed. Um, and that is something that they have said. But ultimately, with all of those working groups that have been created, it's going to be something that comes out of the industry. It's not going to be something that the government will be able to give a response on. It's something that we're going to have to feed back on what is capable. Um, and ultimately, it needs to be something that is accessible by everyone at every stage of the construction and that then is managed in an ongoing fashion and is accessible by the end user, the accountable person as such. Just a final thought for me on that one. I think 
on element I think it may have been touched on is, is really in a degree of independence and impartiality in that validation and verification process. So whether that's client side or an independent advisor and auditor, I uh, don't want to create roles just for the sake of it, but I think the really important thing is if you allow individuals or individual organisations to police their own outputs and data, then that's where things go wrong. So a degree of independence, I think, is, is really needed in that validation process. Um, OK, uh, another question. Just if anyone else has any others, just feel free to pop them in. We're sort of reaching the end of the, of the, um, of the webinar. Um, but the next one was from Glenn Ryder. Um, are there any projects underway and, and by whom uh, to define and align standards between the different value capital sectors that Ollie's presented? to assist a holistic golden thread to be possible? So Ollie, I think that one's for you. Yeah, I think um, it's a good question, Glenn, thanks. The, we're in the infancy of the development of this value toolkit at the moment, um, and, and Ryder are really integral to the development of the metrics that are going to be put forward um, by the Construction Innovation Hub in this space. Now, Alex has touched upon a load of project information that we can work with external companies and impartial advisors, as Peter's mentioned, to get right at this stage. And that's all stuff that we know. We know we know it and we know where the information is. It's just not in a golden thread. So we need to get that bit right as soon as possible and as much as possible on all of our projects. Now, with a view to moving forward in the future, how do we start to capture the information, as Glenn's asked, in all of these different capital areas? Now, in short, Glenn, there is no one project that anybody is capturing all of these metrics on because we haven't yet defined all of the metrics to the nth degree. However, there are a number of individual projects, uh, many of them uh, done internally at Rider, but also quite a few by BIM Academy um, that look at elements of information on projects. So there's projects looking at greenhouse, ga greenhouse gas emissions and um, embodied energy and operational emissions that are going on with the BIM Academy research at the moment on some, some really innovative pioneering stuff. And then we've got projects that are looking at uh, internal optimizations around health and well-being in spaces that Graham has also touched on. So there are pockets of projects, but it's incumbent upon us to try to bring those together into that golden thread um, to be able to, to, to optimize the process entirely. OK, thanks, Ollie. Uh, another question, uh, do you see an incremental development of the definition of the golden thread to avoid the risk of it being perceived as, as everything? Um, just some personal thoughts on that. I think uh, if you go back 10 years when BIM first started to come into the fore, um, BIM is really about the structured um, planning of information. Um, uh, and, and setting clients' needs and aspirations out at the outset of that process. Um, I think there's probably mechanisms within that process that we could look at to, to help with that uh, incremental definition and development of information, plan information, um, essentially going along this, this sort of golden thread philosophy. Um, but I'll just throw that one out to, to Graham uh, or Ollie uh, or Alex. Yeah, if I just um, yeah jump in with effectively what what Peter's said I think um, there is uh, there is a lot of work going on within within the sort of uh, information management ISO 9650 type um, world which is around defining um, what information is required um, I believe there is um, work going on from a from a that fed in from the Hackett report around um, what they believe that golden thread is as well um, and Alex might know a little bit more um, on that as to as to what needs handing over effectively in terms of what what the um, what the digital information is. I think from from my perspective though, it's really really important to work with clients to to really draw out the value there and in, in understanding um, what information is going to be value for, valuable for them not only um, in maintaining and operating their building but also if it is residential for for tenants within within that space. Um, so it's really important that we work with clients to to really define that, um, and it, and it can be it can be different for different clients. But you're right, the the, the key is to make sure that somebody doesn't say on oh, everything, because um, that doesn't help anyone. 
just, just another thought from me on that. I think we've got to be very careful as an industry not to try and reinvent, reinvent the wheel and create a new information management structure called the golden thread um, uh, and, and actually align it with existing structures and standards that have been out there for a few years now and are gradually having more um, embedment in the industry. Sorry, Ollie. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think from my perspective, um, with regards to um, achieving the golden thread that Alex has laid out, this information exists in many organisations already. Um, it's just in separate buckets and it just needs pulling together into onto one common platform. Um, with regards to the development of something that's much more complex, like the value toolkit and the information that we're going to be required to 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 measure and verify in that. Um, it's not really a choice. If you want to be on those frameworks, you have to have the methods in place and the tactics in place to be able to manage that information. But as Peter says, there's, there's, it isn't about reinventing the wheel. A lot of those metrics and measures that are going to be, in fact, most of them that are going to be involved in that value toolkit are measures and metrics that we're required to meet anyway and that exist in existing standards. So it's, it's really all about quality management of your internal information and do you have that level of management over uh, the performance of what you're doing internally to be able to pull into this thread of information? Okay, that's great. Um, we've got one last question and I think we'll make this the last question. Um, can existing construction procurement routes take into account the additional complexity and depth of data, including validation required by what has been presented today? I think I'm going to throw that one at you, Ollie. Existing, yes, no, I am. Yeah, <laughs> with it, I'm just thinking about the. It was a bit of a mouthful of the question. Cheers, Glenn. Um, the <laughs> procurement is addressed in Module Three of the Value Toolkit. So, existing procurement as it currently stands is being slightly amended, um, and the models are being looked at within that Value Toolkit to be able to account for that additional complexity. Um, is is in short the answer, but the government isn't isn't silly. What it's done is essentially place the emphasis and the responsibility back on the company tendering for the work or the team tendering for the work to have a method to be able to do this in place. So it's not providing a complete solution, but it's providing a framework of how it sees reform within the sector and also a framework for tendering that we will then have to develop the methods to achieve that. So it doesn't exist in its entirety yet. Um, and, and we need to get a lot more comfortable very quickly with a, a higher level of complexity. Just uh, just from from a, an ISO 9650 perspective, there's a very, very robust process now in place um, for um, appointing parties, which clients um, to define what information they want and how they want it um, delivered and how they want it validated and verified. Um, so yes, um, and that, that's within the, the, the trench of existing procurement routes. Um, so yes, there, there is um, elements there already that are taking this into a place. And um, the critical bit there again is that we need to support clients in, in understanding how that moves forward. I think what's just just to add on the end of that, if I can, um, the what's really exciting is that we're going through a huge transition as an industry. And as Graham said, we're going to be learning really quickly as businesses as to how much uh, how we do this. But what is absolutely critical is that we learn quickly and we also communicate and educate, and discuss these changes with clients uh, and take them on the journey with us. OK. Um... Thanks, guys, for some great presentations and, and great interaction and the discussion at the end there. Um, I think we'll call it a day there. Thanks, everyone, for, for dialing in and, and watching. Um, we will we have recorded the uh, presentations and discussion, and that'll be put on our website and uh, put on uh, social media uh, shortly. So thanks for joining us, and uh, please keep in touch with us. Thank you.